Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Making a Game in the Desmos Graphing Calculator series. Last time we covered developing the terrain mechanics and laying out the game. In this video, I'll cover creating the first level. I'll go over to design for the first level again briefly here. Some changes have been made since the last video, though. The player starts here and has two simple rolling enemies move towards him. An important thing to keep in mind is that the enemies and objects will move towards the player rather than the player moving towards the enemies and objects. This was done so that the graphing window in Desmos could remain stationary. If the player were to move instead of the enemies, they'd quickly roll off the screen. Anyways, two simple rolling enemies move towards the player. A decent jump must be made in order to get through them. Then, a jumping enemy appears. The jumping enemy will jump over the player, and then the flag is reached. Up here, I placed a coin for the player to get. It requires a tricky jump, as it must be very well timed in order to miss the back of the jumping enemy, but still touch the coin. At the end of the level, as I mentioned before, a flag is placed. Flags dictate the end of a level and are checkpoints to the player. If a player were to die somewhere in level 2, they would respawn at the end of level 1 at the flag instead of restarting the entire game over. So with all the explanation out of the way, let's talk about the enemies. I'll start by adding in the first rolling enemy. Before I get too into it though, I'd like to go over how I'm making the equation of the enemy circles. If you're already familiar with how I'm plotting the circles though, you can go to the timestamp on screen now. The standard equation for a circle is this. To begin, x and y are a set of values that make the equation true. H is the x offset of the circle. Positive h values make the circle move to the right, and negative h values make it move to the left. K works the same way, but with the y offset of the circle. Positive k values make the circle move up, and negative k values make it move down. Our k value, or the y offset, is very simple. We want the enemy to rest on the same ground as the player, and since the enemies are half of the player's size, we can make k z times 1 half, or half of the player's radius. Okay, but what should we do with the x offset or the h value? Well, what we can do is make it vary with time. So if we place h with t, which is our time variable, the circle will move right as time increases. Ideally, we want the enemies to start on the right and move left towards the player, though. So what we can do is create an offset amount for the player to begin at, and subtract time from that to create a circle that moves left with time and starts at a specific value. We can also make the circle move faster by adding a coefficient in front of the time variable, which dictates the circle's speed in units per second. We can see that here, a bigger coefficient makes the circle move faster. Alright, now with all that out of the way, let's talk about adding our first enemy. After quite a bit of consideration, I decided to make him move 10 units per second and start at 20 units. As you can see here, this makes him move fast enough that the player can comfortably jump over him. He also starts far enough away that the player has enough time to react, and close enough that the player isn't waiting a long time for the enemy to come closer. He's pretty close to complete, but you can see that he can pass right through me with no repercussions. What we need is to implement collision detection. I covered how to do this fully in my physics and collisions video on screen now, but I'll give a quick rundown of what I need to do. In effect, what we'll do is find the distance between the centers of the player and enemy circles, and if they're within a player's radius, plus the enemy's radius, this means the circles are touching or intersecting. The equation will then tell the defeat screen to trigger. Past me has been adding this in over my explanation. Here you see that as I touch the enemy, the defeat screen triggers. I added a reset variable up top that if I trigger, the level restarts. Alright, now let's move on to the second enemy. The second enemy is very similar to the first. I made it start at 30 units, or 10 units further back than the first enemy. Initially, I thought that the player would have a difficult time getting through such a small gap, but it ended up feeling pretty solid to jump over. Again, I added collision for this enemy too, very similar to what I did before. The last part of this level involves this jumping enemy. Now, I went in depth on how each enemy functions in the video on screen now, but if you forget, I'll briefly cover it again. The jumping enemy is very similar to the rolling enemies, except our K value differs a little. We decided that the absolute value of sine of t could be used to make a jumping motion. Adding that onto the equation and testing the enemy, you see that he's a very shallow and long jump. This is easily fixed though by adding a constant in front of the whole block, which functions as a height control, and adding a constant in front of the time variable here, which functions as a frequency control. After playing around with a few different values, I eventually settled on these. Now as the jumping enemy approaches the player, as long as the player doesn't jump, he'll pass right over the player. We The idea of this guy is to trick the player into thinking they need to jump, when really doing absolutely nothing is the best course of action. After him is where the real challenge of the level comes in. The challenge coin will be placed right after him so that right after the player passes under the jumping enemy, a really well-timed jump will be required to snag the coin. The circle for the coin is pretty easy to implement, as it's just a moving enemy, but moved up a few units instead of down. After a lot of trial and error, I decided to put the coin 7 units high, and to begin at 50 units. Now the collision detection for the coin is almost identical to the enemies, the only difference being that a collision should trigger the coin counter instead of the defeat screen. The last thing we need to add is a checkpoint at the end of the level. 
The flag itself isn't hard to write in, since we can just use a polygon function and draw a shape that looks roughly like a flag. I'll put the flag full at 55 units for now. It looks good so far, but making it function is going to be the tricky part. The first thing to do is store when a player has reached the checkpoint flag. We can do this by using the data storage technique I covered in the video on screen now. What we can say is that the flag is at 0 units, store that the player has passed level. When the flag is at 0 units, the player is on the flag, so we consider this a when. Because we know the equation for the x position of the flag, we can solve for when it's at 0. I'll use this as our condition to store a checkpoint. I'm going to add a new reset slider, different from the one we have here, in order to reset the checkpoint system. This reset would be used as a total restart of the game, and this one would be used for just a level reset. With all that done, we could test the boolean. As the player approaches the end of the level, whenever he touches the flag, the boolean gets set. This is a great start. Now I want to tap into the time variable and say that if the checkpoint has ever been reached, and if the player ever resets, start at the flag instead of from zero. We can do this by solving for the time where the player is right in front of the flag, and if the checkpoint boolean has ever been triggered, starting from that time instead of zero. Alright, I got it all configured now and you can see that I'm ready to test the level. Here I'll cheat to beat the level, because I'm cool like that. Okay, as I get past the checkpoint flag, you see that the checkpoint boolean has been set. Now if I trigger the reset boolean, I start at the flag instead of the start. The final test is to see if I can use the master reset as well to start back at the beginning. And you see here that it works. I was going to include level 2 in this episode, but it ended up introducing some new features like the checkpoint system that took some time to develop. So I'll save that for the next episode. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss creating the next few sections of my game. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask below. Until next time.